Okay, hello everybody. Today we have with us Dr. Theodore Belfour. Um, Dr. Belfour has been in um, dentistry practice. This coming up, this year it'll be 50 years. He did his dental college at New York University, New York University, and he is a senior certified lecturer at the International Association of Orthodontics. Is that correct? Senior certified instructor is the senior, title. Senior agency. certified instructor. Okay, um, I stand corrected. Um, <laughs> so, Doctor Belfour, I guess um, we're going to get into um, intermittent forces and how how people can grow their maxilla and grow their airway. Before we go into that, can we tell parents a little bit about um, the myth? of the overgrown maxilla and and what they should be thinking if they're in a dentist's or an orthodontist's office and he says your kid's maxilla is overgrown we need to pull it back well the uh, anthropologists will tell us that uh, in evolution are we're actually evolving smaller jaws and a, uh, a an upper jaw or maxilla to be too large is almost is unheard of today the uh, larger the maxilla, the larger the nasal opening, the better we breathe. The larger the maxilla, the more the mandible can come forward, the better we breathe. The mandible itself is a victim of the maxilla. If the maxilla is underdeveloped, then the mandible is forced back. When the maxilla is fully developed, the mandible is free to move forward and be in position for proper breathing. Dr. Belfour, would you ever use a growth stunting appliance on a child uh, such as a cervical headgear, a high pull headgear, or a Holly retainer, upper and lower, to uh, fix the width of their jaws before growth is complete? I would not. The answer is no. <laughs> I mean, what are the consequences of that? Well, you don't want to do anything at all to prevent, prevent the full genetic expression of our full genetic potential. Nature wants us to grow to our full potential. Anything that stops us from reaching our full potential compromises us, compromises in the case of the mid-face our general health. So if you, if an orthodontist takes a kid, gives that kid cervical headgear, stunts the growth of the maxilla, pulls it back, what's happening to this kid's airway? Well, the, the airway in an anterior-posterior direction is compromised. What does anterior-posterior mean? But it's really worse than that. It's really much worse than that. Because when you stunt the growth of the maxilla, you, you compromise the openings, the most important openings from the sinuses, the nasal sinuses, which are above on the side and behind our nose. They have a purpose. Their purpose is to generate a gaseous molecule called nitric oxide. That nitric oxide, which is generated in the sinuses, goes into the back of the nose. It pools in the back of the nose. And that's when you breathe in deeply, you're sending that nitric oxide deep into your lungs. And what we learned in 1998, when uh, researchers received the Nobel Prize, we learned that that molecule is a vasodilator. It dilates the small capillaries and allows for the proper oxygen and carbon dioxide transfer. And it is enormously important in our general health. That same nitric oxide that pools in the back of the nose is actually our first line of defense against pathogens that enter the nose. If a pathogen enters the nose, it's trapped in the mucus and the cilia and the nitric oxide destroys it. When the nitric oxide is not there, then we have inflammation and white blood cells come to destroy the pathogen and that's called infection. 
So the way we get sinusitis is when the nitric oxide, the normal nitric oxide physiology and metabolism is not working. And that happens when the maxilla is not fully grown. That happens all the time because the little openings from the sinus into the back of the nose are compromised. When the maxilla is fully developed, those openings are large. And when you breathe in, a normal, when normally when you breathe in, the air goes in your nostrils, up around your turbinates, into your nose, down behind your tongue, down behind your tongue, into your oropharynx, into your lungs. But as it passes through and around, uh, through into your nose, it mixes with the air from your sinuses. That's a circulation of air between the air in the nose and the air in the sinuses. When those openings are blocked, that doesn't happen. Okay. And that those when we don't have full development of the upper jaw, that affects us our health. So we get colds all the time. We get sinusitis. We get chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. We are severely compromised. What happens when you have this chronic rhinosinusitis? We, you get a compromise in your immune system. Your immune system changes. The body is in a constant inflammatory state, and that constant inflammatory state wears the body down. The body gives up, and the immune system goes away. And that's when you have hypersensitivity to allergens. You have asthma. You have all these problems, and it all stems from lack of full development in the maxilla. That's how important it is that an orthodontist does not do anything to compromise that growth. Dr. Belfort, a headgear is, is a, it straps onto the back of the spine at the neck, the cervical spine, and pulls against the maxilla. In between the cervical spine and the maxilla, you have other openings, right? You've got the carotid canal, the jugular foramen, the foramen oval. Um, where where nerves, veins go. But the carotid canal is where the carotid artery flows and gives blood to the brain. The lines of force with the headgear pass right through the carotid canal. So are we in fact shrinking people's carotid, the space for the carotid artery when they wear headgear? Um, I can't answer that question. I haven't seen the research or the literature on it. Do you think orthodontists have even bothered to look at that? I, I can't give an opinion on that. Okay. Um, okay, what about obstructive sleep apnea? The, the headgear um, pushes the maxilla back, prevents the mandible from coming out. Can that cause obstructive sleep apnea? Uh, well, anything that prevents full development of the maxilla can contribute to obstructive sleep apnea. Okay. The fact is that our tongue is the culprit in sleep apnea, and our tongue posture is extremely significant. If the upper jaw is compromised, the tongue remains in the lower jaw which contributes to further shrinkage of the size of the upper jaw. And when the tongue remains in the lower jaw, it sits down the throat, down into the throat, and that is a strong contributing factor to sleep apnea. So to reverse that process, to develop the upper jaw, mm -hmm. and for the tongue to sit flat against the palate, is to take the tongue out of the throat and for allow for proper breathing and and minimize possibility of sleep apnea. Okay, I'm being dramatic here, but sleep apnea is life threatening. It can kill someone, right? Absolutely. Look at James Gandolfini. Okay, so cervical headgear can cause sleep apnea. Can you then say cervical headgear is deadly? Well, you, you're trying to draw a direct line. We can say that uh, the use of headgear can compromise maxillary position, which in turn compromises mandibular position, which then can contribute to obstructive sleep apnea. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit about bicuspid extractions. There's been this 100-year-old war going on where you have the extractionist saying it's no problem, and you have the expansionist saying, hey, look, you're pulling teeth out, uh, the face looks collapsed, and and um, you are impacting the airway. Then the extractionists come along and they publish a study which says that you know, reducing the perimeter of the arches does not change the size of the airway, but what they don't look at is where does the tongue, where the tongue goes when the person is sleeping. So my question to you is, if you pull out four teeth and you, you pull teeth back to close the gaps, is there more or is there less space for the tongue? Well, it's obvious there, there is less space for the tongue, but for the viewing audience, what's really obvious is you're reducing the volume in the mid-face. The way that we age is going from a grape to a raisin. We age by losing mid-face volume. That's what causes the sagging, the slipping of the buccal fat pad down to create these lines. It creates the uh, thinness in the upper lip, um, the sagging of the lower eyelids, all the things that contribute to an aging face is the loss of volume. When you remove bicuspids, you are, what you're generating is premature aging of the face. When it's done for a teenager, it's not obvious because uh, the way we're created, we have the most mid-face volume when we're in our teenage. It's most attractive. And I guess that's the way nature designed us, to be most attractive. And what happens out of teenage, we begin to shrink. Everything begins to shrink. We begin to lose fat, collagen, and bone volume. And that's how we age. So by removing bicuspid teeth, we're causing premature aging in the face. Okay. And what about breathing? It's at night. Is you know, does does the tongue? Well, What's this is controversial. There? Once again, yeah. you, you're you're you're, te you're stepping you're you're stepping into controversial territory. Okay. But what I mentioned about facial aging should be enough of a reason not to do it. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. I know it's controversial. Um, okay, what I'm going to do is to keep the file size small, I'm going to pause the recording and we're going to restart it and we're going to talk about what adults can do, what reciprocal forces are, uh, not reciprocal, sorry, um, intermittent mean? intermittent forces and, and uh, how that can help, yeah, how that can help regain lost growth and increase the, the volume of the mid face and the airway. Sure. So I'm pressing pause right now.